Hi everybody, this is uh, John here with another uh, model inbox review. Um, this time I'm doing something pretty old, and I'm not joking, the other kit is pretty old as well. Um, I'm doing the Airfix 70 second scale Illusion IL-28 NATO codename Beagle Bomber. Um, not quite sure which version I'm going to build this one yet because I'm still rummaging through some of the reviews that I've had a look on YouTube recently and eBay and uh, sorry not eBay um, on Google searches and had a look at some of the reviews and some people have said that this kit is a bit of a, a fit problem um, and they wish that they'd had an aircraft which was painted anything but silver so I'm sort of tempted to do the Chinese People's Liberation um, Communist Air Force version because it has dark green upper surfaces and it says on the kit that it's actually silver but I'm pretty sure it's it's sea, uh, sea, medium sea grey underneath um, <clears throat> but I'll look into that more and get some more of an idea of what, what the score is first of all we'll kick off like normal with the, uh, the boxing history so we'll just take this off um, and I want to take that off as well because I don't need that basically um, Airfix released this kit back in the late 60s its release date was actually 1968 and in, when it was originally released it was released on a red stripe box um, which is really interesting because when models were released in the red stripe box their instructions were very um, they were very illuminating, and I'll explain that to you when I get to the inbox review. Um, <clears throat> the difference between more modern, uh, even eight, even the difference between the 60s and even the 70s instruction leaflets was staggering. But I'll explain when we get to the review. Um, so basically, the, the first release of this kit was 1968, which actually makes the kit um, 49 years old. So it's nearly it's been 50 years old next year. Um, so yeah, interesting. Um, the kit wasn't just released uh, on the Red Stripe box, it was also released on the MPC American um, marketing release. Exactly the same kit, it's, it's pretty much the same um, artwork, it's just uh, the, the aircraft image was just superimposed over what looks like the side of a table in a blank white piece of uh, canvas on the front of the box. But MPC, of course, is um, Airfix's American label. Um, they, they released these two kits simultaneously in 1968. Uh, the red stripe went through until about the 70s. I'm not sh quite sure whether this kit was released in the ordinary 70s logo boxes, but I had never seen any on the standard blue logo um, releases from about 1973 through to 76 um, when they changed the logo boxings. I've never seen the IL-28 in those boxes, so it is possible they could have took the kit off the market. Um, but according to Scalemates, who have a boxing history, which is um, and it's a good source of information, um, the kit wasn't re-released until it was really re-released on the new boxings, and this happened in 1978 um, when the kit was released as a brand new model. It wasn't a brand new model, it was actually the same moulds as what they released in 1968. The difference with this kit is that it had Russian markings in it. In the original 68 release, the kit um, only had Eastern Bloc and Chinese markings. But in 1978, they released it as a brand new issue model, and it had Soviet Air Force markings, um, along with the, I'm pretty sure I had all the other original markings with it as well. Not quite sure about the Chinese ones, but um, it definitely had the Czech and Polish markings that went with the original 68 release. Uh, that boxing went through until 1992, but in between that, uh, there was a company set up in Europe, under America, um, I'm not quite sure whether it was part of the MPC labelling or part of the MPC marketing, um, but they turned to US Airfix um, 
Now, I'm not quite sure whether MPC was just a dropped brand name and they went over to US Airfix, I'm not quite sure, but these models were released around about the early 1990s and I'm pretty sure um, they're quite easily available and you can get them quite easily in, in America and I have actually seen some for sale on eBay from Europe and Germany and places like Greece and France. So it is possible that US Airfix might have been a marketing brand um, which was set up by MPC for sales in Europe and these kits, the, the US Airfix models, actually had completely different markings. I don't even know what nationality markings those are. Perhaps somebody could put something in the comments and let me know because I've <laughs> never seen those roundels ever before. Um, it will probably become apparent, uh, but it would, I would appreciate someone to give me a comment and let me know what they are. Uh, interesting, yeah, but this kit again is a green upper services like the Chinese aircraft, and again, this would have been a, uh, an option that I would have considered. Um, the last Airfix uh, rendition release of this kit was a re-release, re-boxing of the aircraft uh, in 1992. Um, and obviously at the time... Heller and Humbrell had um, acquired the company from Palatoy. Um, and it is possible that Palatoy, whilst they owned Airfix, did not release the IL-28 at all. Um, which is a shame, actually, because although the kit has serious fit issues, at the time of release, especially in the 70s, this kit was quite exclusive. There wasn't an awful lot of other models. I think Tamiya did build the 1100 scale in the combat series. Um, but I think it's not until quite recently when the Trumpeter model in 72nd scale and Italieri had a bash at one as well, um, which I think more sort of coincided with the, the Harbin H5 copy from China rather than the original uh, Soviet-built aircraft for the Eastern Bloc countries. But that was the last rendition that Airfix produced this kit and I haven't seen it released on any of the Hornby releasings. So I'm pretty sure 1992 was the last boxing um, that this kit underwent. And I'm not quite sure when it went off the market. I probably would have expected it would have been around about 1996. Um, so that's the boxing history. So it's interesting to note that this kit um, is, is nearly 50 years old. There is actually another release um, of an Airfix model, and I'm not quite sure where this release um, manifested itself somewhere in the world but I'm guessing it could have been somewhere like Spain or maybe Italy um, but Lodela which is an Airfix brand um, also boxed this kit uh, in the mid 90s I think this was released in 1994 so <coughs> but again it was the original 1990 well the original 1968 release kit inside but it had the 1992 and 1978 markings inside the box. So that's, that's as I said, that's all the boxing history, and that's a lovely view of an IL-28 Beagle sat on the deck. That's a Soviet Air Force one, obviously. And what I want to quickly do now is um, I just want to quickly pan the camera, if I can, sorry about this. You know, you know how it is, guys. Pan the camera down here, and then hopefully you can see the kit I'm about to review. Now you'll have to excuse me here because the box <laughs> the box is pretty horrendous isn't it? I did get this kit second hand. I didn't pay a huge amount of money for it but I got it from a local trader through eBay. Um, I think I paid around about seven quid for it uh, <clears throat> and I just went around this house and collected it so there's no post to pay. So the kit cost me about seven quid and fortunately Although the box is pretty horrendous, I've opened it up and checked all the parts. All the parts are present and correct, um, which is nice. You get a, you're supposed to only get one of these slips, but for some reason I've got two in here. These are the, these are the original uh, 1960s complaint slips that came inside all Airfix kits. These are the instructions. We'll have a look at these in a minute, and that's all the bagged parts. We'll have a look at those in a minute. First of all, I want to have a look at the, um, the decals. Because although these decals are old and they're pretty, they're pretty yellowed, um, the version I'm fancying building is the Chinese version, which is the green upper surfaces with medium sea grey underneath. 
And these transfers, yeah, cars are graft, they're not. <laughs> but um, these are 1968 issued decals, and they are pretty awful, aren't they? So I'm probably going to be possibly looking for some aftermarket decals. But the thing that I find interesting about these decals is, is that the markings that I'm fancying using are the ones that look like they've got the least amount of carrying sheen. Because these are the uh, these are the Czech markings and these are the Polish markings. And they carry quite a lot of carrier sheen. But these are the Chinese People's, Liber uh, People's Liberation Army Air Force markings. And although they carry a little bit of sheen, they don't carry an awful lot of sheen outside of the markings themselves. Because these parts here are actually the right colour. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to get some aftermarket markings because they're pretty thick. They're quite raised. But uh, as I said, they are quite old. They might be quite useful to a collector. So I could, I could get some aftermarket markings for this and maybe pop these on eBay for 50p or something to somebody who fancies putting them in a box for them. But that's the decals. The decals are pretty old and they're pretty... I wouldn't recommend using them as a modeler. The instruction leaflet. I said I was going to talk about these instructions, didn't I? Well, with the modern Airfix models that are released by Hornby, basically you get sometimes a color colorized um, set of plans. And they say that pictures can say as much as a thousand words. Well, one of the things I liked about making models um, that were releases from the 60s, when the red stripe boxes were being released by FX, is that you had plans like these. There's your colour codes. They're not particularly clear and interesting, but they give you enough information. I mean, basically, both those two outer versions are silver all over. So you can't really go wrong, can you? And this kit is M3, which is matte 30 in the Humbrol colours, upper surfaces, and it says it's silver. But I've looked at a few photographs of Chinese Nationalist Air Force aircraft, and I'm pretty sure they're either a medium sky grey or they're a medium sea grey. It's quite difficult to tell because some of the photos are quite old. Um, and... They're a bit, uh, they're a bit hazy. Do you know what I mean? But <clears throat> also, modern aircraft kits tend to be built in lots and lots of steps. And as you can see from this instruction leaflet, there are only two. There's two steps. This is step one, and this is step two. But, and here's the big thing. When you bought kits from Airfix that were red stripe boxings, or even before. Um, type 1s and Type 2 boxes. They had instruction leaflets inside which were similar to these. And these instructions, although there are, a lot, there, there are lots and lots and lots of parts to put in each step, Airfix didn't intend you to build everything all at once in each step. What they're actually doing is, in the uh, text on the, on the instruction sheet, is a full fully laid out um, instructions in writing of how to build this kit and what to do at every step of the way. They're actually telling you um, the icons, all the parts are, are all, they're all like listed as individual parts and there's no differences in the actual part numbers. They're not telling you in the part numbers icons that, that some of these parts are transparent. But this part here, 34, part 35 and part 36 are obviously transparent. Um, there's a couple of windows. There's a window that goes on the side here. That's obviously transparent, part 16. Um, so we know they're transparent, but the instructions don't tell you. But in actual fact, they do. Because I'm going to read you a couple of segments of this so that you can understand what I mean. Each part is clearly ID'd and it even tells you what the part's called. For instance, these two parts down here, 12 and 11, right? Now, on modern instruction leaflets, it wouldn't tell you what those parts are called, and it's a bit vague as to what they are. But part 12 and 11 is located in step 9 in the instructions 
and it states cement locating pins on lower half of the rear gunner's door. Part 11 into the locating holes in the upper half. Part 12. And then you set that sub assembly aside to dry. So they're actually telling you that when you put 10 and 11, sorry, 11 and 12 together, you don't just put it straight into the kit, you have to put it aside to dry. And I would recommend putting it aside to dry for about two or three hours. And it's like this all the way through the instructions. The instructions, I always found the instructions on these Airfix kits when I was a kid quite complicated. But when I'm looking at them now, they're actually they're very beneficial to a modeler because if you especially a novice modeler, because if you um if you don't really know how to do certain things in kits uh, to make to make the kit work right to make the kit the way it was engineered these instructions tell you exactly how to do it step 13 commencing forward place but do not cement the pivot pins on the nose wheel leg part 20 and the rear gunners doors into locations in the port fuselage half that's actually telling you not to glue these parts into place that's so that the rear gunner's door platform lowers and then locates back into its raised position and the nose wheel will actually retract into the fuselage and you can put it back out. Um, this kit actually has completely working retractable undercarriage and the main gears, I'm pretty sure, swivel through 90 degrees before they go into the undercarriage bays. Um, and as with an awful lot of Airfix, well, as of an awful lot of, air, of uh, uh, aircraft models that were, that were designed in the 60s and 70s, they have a lot of moving parts. I think the rudder on this kit and the ailerons move, as well as the undercarriage. Um, so there are there is quite a lot going on in this kit. Uh, so this is what was I always found interesting about the, the 70s instructions is the fact that each step of the way you're told exactly what to do when to do it how to do it and what to do with the parts when you know if you need to put stuff aside to dry it actually tells you it doesn't do that so much in modern mo models it does do that in Revell kits because i've noticed on some Revell instructions it actually puts a little clock with a number of minutes which you have to set aside to dry for sub assemblies and things but this actually tells you that you've got to do it and i quite like that i've I think that's it's pretty idiot proof, isn't it? Let's be honest with you. But the instructions themselves, they did look as I remember as a, as a child, I did look at these and think, God, this is this is complicated. And I think a lot of mistakes might have been made by me when I was sort of eight, nine years old, because you know what kids are like. They don't tend to do all this. They tend to just do all that, get it get it done and built, and get it as done as quickly as possible. So that's the instructions. There's also a nice. Um, read out here on the aircraft's history and um, the fact that the aircraft was actually a, com a complete design set to counteract the Canberra from the RAF service. Not an American design, a British one. And I always found that quite interesting. I'm going to open the, uh, the bag up now. And what I'll do is I'll put all the parts into the lid. It's a shame you can't see the box art on here. And all the adverts for the other aircraft kits that Airfix did because unfortunately the guy bought it off and tapes everything up. I think he tapes everything up to make sure that there are no parts go missing. <clears throat> it doesn't always work, does it? But anyway, we'll just quickly go through um, the parts so that I can explain a little bit about this kit, its issues and the things I like about it and the things I don't like about it because it, it, I have mixed feelings about this kit. Now I do remember when I was about 10, I do remember building this kit and I do remember my brother at the time he actually made more models than I did. Um, I tended to make models because he did and he, he was really the person who got me into modeling originally. Um, but that all set aside. Let's just pull this out so we can get it all into the box. There's a bit of flame in it on the side, so it's only a Russian, a Russian pilot there. Right, <clears throat> we'll put the bag, 
put the bag down there because I'll put all this stuff back in the bag after I've done the video. Um, Airfix always gave you a stand. This kit is a Series 4 kit, so it's quite a serious stand. Um, and these are actually quite collectible. You don't tend to get them in kits that were built after 1980 when Panatoy took over. I think they stopped building the stands. But one of the things I noticed um, about three or four years ago is that Hornby started to remould <laughs> and sell these stands, the stand packs. Um, and you can get them, even some of the old design stands, you can get them as separate accessories from Hornby, um, which is great. But the original Airfix used to just include them free in the, in the kit. We'll start with the transparencies, because the transparencies, a lot of people feel, are a denote to how good the quality of the kit is. And bearing in mind, this is a 49-year-old mould. Um, the transparencies aren't that bad. This is the nose cone, which is a birdcade nose, nose cone. Um, it's framed out. It's pretty similar in design, actually, to the HE111, but obviously a lot smaller. Um, and it would be framed all the way round. And the thing that I notice about this is, yes, the plastic, you can see the plastic there against my hand. The plastic is quite thick, right? But it's quite clear. And I'm putting my finger inside that plastic and I can sort of see my fingerprints through the glazing. Um, which is, when you think this mould is 49 years old, it's, it's not that bad, is it? I've seen an awful lot worse from kits made an awful lot younger than this. So the, the quality of the transparencies look quite good. You've got the single seat cockpit there because the IL-28, although it was a bomber, the pilot actually sat in a backed cockpit canopy above the fuselage and you had quite a good field of vision to the side and front. Um, you had a little... Uh, side window there which went to the back of the canopy glazing the nose glazing sorry and this is the rear gunners window um, and they're pretty clear and again I'll put my fingers through there this canopy isn't actually as clear as the dome canopy at, at the front of the aircraft but really all you're going to see through that canopy is the pilot's shoulders and head and you could possibly if you wanted to mess about with an instrument panel, you could possibly see an instrument panel and the bulkhead and the ejection seat for the back, although I'm not sure if the aircraft had an ejection seat. But the the quality of those and those transparencies isn't actually that bad. I've seen an awful lot worse, even from Airfix, uh, models that were manufactured when the, where the jigs were manufactured um, a lot later than these. Right. <clears throat> Now then, that's one of the ailerons that go on the wings. Moulding on it is quite reasonable. Um, you've got the pins there, so the ailerons will definitely move. I think you've got five sprues on this kit. And the kit's moulded in uh, the same colour as the Airfix B17 and a lot of the MiGs and a lot of the Century Series aircraft. It's moulded in this sort of silver grey plastic. So Airfix, Airfix used to do something that Matchbox didn't do. Matchbox tended to do two colour kits, whereas Airfix tended to build their kits in a lot of different colours to try and reflect um, the overall colour of what the original aircraft looked like. And this thing was more or less silver. So the plastic is more or less silver, isn't it? So again... You know, the younger generation might not have wanted to bother painting this, this kit. Um, we've got the horizontal stabilisers, or, or more, more correctly called tailplanes. That looks like the upper surfaces of them. Uh, the lower surfaces are probably on a different sprue. Or they might even be loose. I have checked this kit. It's definitely all here. Yeah, they're loose. Loose in the box. <clears throat> now then, the first thing I want to talk about is the panel lines, because this kit has raised panel lines, and they're quite serious. The, the, the raised panel line going along 
that edge, the leading edge of that tail plane there is, is quite pronounced and it would require a little tiny bit of sanding down to take some of that edge off but you've also got quite a bit of detailing here um, I'm not sure whether it's rivets or whether it's some sort of uh, avionic uh, application to the tail planes but you'd have to make sure you didn't sand those down too far because they they look like an integral part of the tail planes detail um, but again it is raised panel lines but it is a 16 68 issue kit so I was expecting raised panel lines um, this is one of the wings uh, I think that wing goes into there like that yeah again raised panel lines they're quite tall they, they are quite pronounced you are going to need to sand some of them down a little bit but not all the way um, or you could take them right the way down and rescribe them but what a lot of modelers do there's a, a guy in America um, that I've been following quite a bit recently called the International British Modeler um, and what he's told me actually on a comment once that he doesn't tend to um, mess about with rescribing lines what he does is he sort of shades them to make them appear like they're recessed and it's a technique that I would like to talk to him a bit more about because it's something I don't really do. Um, yeah, but it would be quite interesting to see how he does that. So you've got raised lines here, the, the flaps, um, the ailerons and all the panels on here, they are quite defined and they will need taken down. Um, the other wing is the same. They're quite good quality parts, mind. Um, I don't think Airfix ever really had certain issues in the 60s with the quality of their plastic. It was reasonably good. Although there are a couple of issues on here, but I'm pretty sure they're meant to be there. They look like, I don't know if you can see them, but on this wing there, you can just see it there, there looks like a sinkhole in the actual plastic. But if you turn it over to see the inside, that sinkhole... Oh, I don't know, it might be where that pin is actually. You're going to have to look at some photographs of this because I think that sinkhole relates to the bottom of that pin. So again, you might have to fill that. You probably have to fill it, but it's only a tiny sinkhole. It's nothing really that bad. And it's the same on the other, on the other side, um, but it's in exactly the same place. And I wondered whether it was actually a detail of the aircraft. But I'm going to have to look at some photos of that. But if they if they aren't a detail of the aircraft, a little bit of filler there, it's not going to be a problem. These are the undercarriage bays for the engine nacelles. Obviously the lower halves. The quality on the moulding is very, very crisp and nice. Um, the location holes and the lugs for the undercarriage wheels, uh, undercarriage oleos rather, are, are quite broad. They're not going to be a problem to hold the the weight of the aircraft. Airfix always, um, they always interested me in how much of the aircraft they tried to get moving. Uh, again, you've got a nice raised panel line at the back of there. That should definitely be a recessed panel line because that's the section of the engine pod that comes away to access the engine. A um, little bit of in interesting information about the IL-28 Beagle is it actually had two engines exactly the same as the MiG-15. They had VK-1 turbojets later replaced by VK-5 turbojets. And they were the same engines that went in the MiG-15 and the MiG-15 Biz. Um, so the aircraft actually had British engines in them because everybody knows the VK-1 was just a Russian-built copy of the Rolls-Royce Neen. Fuselage halves. Right. <clears throat> Got a couple of bulkheads in here, uh, one forward obviously for the forward cockpit and one rear for the rear gunner's position. Um, I'll put that one away because this is just basically a carbon copy of this side. I've got an issue with this kit and I've just noticed it today. I didn't realise I had this issue with this model but it's not something that's going to be a, a serious problem. Um, because when I fit the fuselage halves together, um, I've got a piece of missing injection moulding there at the front of there. Can you just see that? 
that's what we call short molds. It's where the injection hasn't quite gone into the extent of the molding that's produced the part. Uh, so I'm going to have to probably fill that with a piece of plastic card. Um, or there are other ways of dealing with that. Um, you can often use filler after you've put the weighting into the aircraft uh, because this aircraft is going to require some substantial amount of weight because otherwise it'll sit on its tail. Um, the aircraft will want to sit on its tail quite easily. The, re the recess panel lines, they're non-existent on this kit. Sorry, the raised panel lines are definitely here. They're, they're very pronounced at the back here. Um, and again at the front, they're quite pronounced, they're quite high. Again, you'll need to sand some of those down a little bit. Um, there is a little bit of detail in here, um, which you'll have to make sure you don't take away. It's it's a nice, it's quite a nicely detailed kit actually for when you think that you know how old it is and how much information and photographs there were uh, available of this aircraft at the time. You've got optional position tip tanks and um, other bits and bobs. There's one of that's probably the cockpit bulkhead. One of the wheels. Um, I'll show you something else about this kit. That's one of the main undercarriage gear olio. Actually, it might be the nose wheel gear olio. But the undercarriage on this kit definitely retracts, which is nice. Um, we've got a few bits and bobs inside here, which I don't really need to go into too much because the just the basic run of the mill pilot seat. I'll show you. I'll show you the um, typical '60s pilot. <laughs> This is a typical 60s pilot. I'm going to try and get him in focus here so you can see him. But basically, that's a similar type of pilot that you get in all 1960s modern aircraft subjects. You get this pilot in the Western Scout. You get it in the Hunter, the Lightning. He's exactly the same guy. Um, so this guy flies aircraft all over the world. And he's called every name you could possibly think of. He's quite detailed. Um, he's got he's got webbing for the uh, for the ejection seat. He's got a decent helmet with a visor. He's got facial mouldings. He's actually got a decent hand. I'm not sure how many fingers are on it. But this particular guy has got no legs, which is a shame. Um, most of the Airfix pilots do have legs, but this guy hasn't. Um, that's the optional tip tanks, and I think that's one of the rudder halves. Um, again, they're quite nicely moulded. Nice, again, they're raised panel lines, but you can sand them down a little bit. Um, a lot of people, as I said, a lot of people don't don't worry about the raised panel lines. They just deal with them in a different way. This is one of the engine forward engine bulkheads, and it shows the front of the engine. Um, I'm not quite sure how correct that is because I'm pretty sure that most turbofan engines have a fan at the front, a compressor fan at the front. Not one that is a turbo um, bypass fan, like a turbofan, but they still have a fan at the front, a com like the Ford compressor fan. Um, so I'm not quite sure how accurate that is, but as I said, the, the Neen engine was actually a centrifugal engine, so it it probably wouldn't have had a, a fan at the front, would it? It would have been a centrifugal engine where you'd had the fans at the back and the combustion chambers all fed into a circular motion. This is um, the third sprue. This comprises quite a lot of small parts. Uh, there's a pilot seat there, two undercarriage doors, um, some bits and pieces for the un for the undercarriage oleos and what looks like the main cockpit floor. Um, Again, the parts are quite well moulded. One of the things I've noticed on this kit, although it shouldn't really surprise me because this kit is actually in a red stripe box, which means the mould when these parts were made was quite fresh. It was quite fresh and new. So, But there's, there's no flash on any of these parts at all. There's no burring. There's no bits you've got to sand away. There's nothing. It's really crisp. And there's two more pilots there, exactly the same as the other guys that we saw before. Um, and unfortunately, they're par they're, they're, they obviously get around in the shopping centre in wheelchairs as well, don't they? Because um, they haven't got any legs either. 
but they're nicely detailed. The pilots are nicely detailed. The kit is actually quite detailed. There's quite a lot of work to do in this model. Um, so the, it's going to be interesting to get stuck into it. Although looking at a lot of the reviews that some people have done, um, this kit has some serious fit issues, which is a shame. I'm going to go through the technical gump now before I close this video off. Um, and then you might get some more information as you know before you commit to buying one of these if you fancy buying one of these. The kit is an Airfix Illusion IL-22 Soviet bomber. NATO codenamed Beagle. It was released in 1968 in Series 4 in a red box, uh, sorry, a red stripe boxing. And the kit's made in 172nd scale. The dimensions of the model are 9 inches in length, it's 11.5 inches span, and it sits 3.5 inches high on its undercarriage. And the kit is made up comprising of 84 silver grey plastic parts on 5 sprues and 5 transparency parts totaling 89 parts in total. The decals supplied for this kit are for three different versions, the Czech, Polish and the Chinese Nationalist Air Force, but later version releases from Airfix also included the Soviet Air Force as well. Uh, the cost of the kit in the red stripe boxing is, I have seen it at ridiculous, ri ridiculous prices, high and low. I've seen it as little as three or four pound, um, but I have also seen it for 40. Um, so it does depend on how well people know how much this kit is worth or how greedy people are. Um, but in my opinion, if you can pick it up for somewhere around about 10 to 15 pounds, you're doing quite well. Later renditions uh, retail for between 10 and 15. These would be the uh, Hella boxings um, and the, the later reissue boxings with the Soviet Air Forces. The US Airfix releases an MPC boxings retail for between 18 and 25 pound. That would equate to about 20 to 30 dollars. First impressions of the model, it's a typical 1960s Airfix release with lots of moving parts. Um, lots and lots of parts and work to do in the kit. The aircraft actually has a moving rudder and moving ailerons. It has a fully retractable undercarriage and its rear gunner's entry door opens and closes. The kit is old and it does have some fit issues. The fit is very suspect. Probably not a recommended kit for, for a novice or maybe as a first kit's attempt. Um, it, this kit is probably, it would suit somebody who has been building models, I would say for at least three or four months before I would even look at something like this because the fit issues on this kit are considerable. Um, especially around the joins to the canopy and the main airframe. Uh, the Chinese version is tempting because its dark green upper surfaces will hide an awful lot of the faults, especially around the, around the canopy and tail and nose glazings, as I said, because the green, matte green, tends to hide an awful lot more than silver or foil finish aluminium polished aluminium kits. A lot of people, I've seen a lot of people build this kit and they build it with a really shine finish, silver finish. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you now, I've looked at a lot of photographs of this kit. Uh, sorry, a lot of photographs of this aeroplane in reality, pictures taken of the real thing. And I've never seen it looking like a mirror. This kit is often a very bland aluminium finish plane um, and I don't think I've ever seen one that's really shiny. Uh, the ones in the Monino Museum are so dull that they look like they're corroded aluminium and the other variants tend to be camouflaged and some of them quite vibrantly and the green ones tend to be heat damaged uh, quite considerably so if you were to build this kit and you wanted to make it look like the real thing, you would have to. Um, I'm trying to think of the word. You would have to uh, make the finish quite rough, and it would have to look old. 
there's a word for it, I can't think what the word is. But basically you'd have to make the you'd have to take the shine finish off and make it quite dull and drab. Almost like shabby chic versions of silver. Um, and as I said, the green coloured ones and the camouflage coloured ones did tend to look quite distressed. That's the word I'm thinking of, distressed. Um, with the sun damage on the paintwork. Uh, so to sum everything up, the kit's not cheap. It's not an easy build. It's quite a tricky build. Um, and you'd probably want to use aftermarket markings. Um, but there is two uh, companies which will be knights in shining armour. Um, and there's another company that built this kit in 1 100 scale as well. And I've seen a review of that. The Tamiya 1 100 scale in the Air Combat series is actually a nice, very nice, and easy to build and well fitting kit. Um, but 72nd scale is covered by two companies as well. Trumpeter do one, which is um, it, it's a more modern approach to the to the aircraft, and Itellery do one, which is a sort of more Chinese copy approach to the aircraft, and both these two models are probably going to build better than the Airfix kit. But the thing you have to remember about the Airfix kit is is that the Airfix kit is the one that you want if you want all the moving parts unretractable undercarriage things like this the other two kits don't produce that they don't have working rudders ailerons elevators and stuff like that um, they, they tend to be just pure static models whereas the airfix kit yeah it's a lot of work it is a lot of work as well i do remember when i did build this kit i think i was about 13 um, and i gave up i gave up before i even assembled the airframe because it was just too it was too tricky a build for me and I think my brother had to finish it off um, and then I painted it and probably destroyed it trying to paint it uh, but as I said it, it is a lot of work it's it's got faults that will need addressing uh, quite a bit of proprietary work but if you have the skills and the time I can see this model being quite rewarding because it's quite accurate the IL-28 really did look as hideous as the kit produces it. It was a pretty crude, um, very early jet bomber that was designed to counteract the Canberra. And I think the Canberra, to be honest with you, is a much better aircraft. But uh, yeah, the Soviets built them by the thousands. So if you fancy an Airfix IL-28 Beagle, they're not cheap. Uh, they're not easy to build. but. If you fancy doing a lot of work, I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun messing around with it. Good luck out there, and I'll see you with the next video. Have fun and carry on modelling. Bye-bye, lads.